<laughs> Recording in progress. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> I know, I wasn't expecting a little light switch. Um, anyways, I just want to say first, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it is wonderful to be here, and thank you, Brooke, for um, the kind words earlier. Um, and I will just say, I got here a little bit early, and I think the church was locked, so I was like, oh. So I just went and drove around town a little bit, and it's a charming town, so it's very cool to be here in, in Delaware. I am far, and I will, I will just say briefly, um, my name is Daniel Heron. I am from western Washington state, so a little stone's hop across the country. Um, I, as Brooke mentioned, I do serve on the Covenant Network's board of directors, um, something that I've only recently started. So like, I'm gonna, I, I can provide some information, but of course I'll provide my contact information as well so you can reach out with anything more. Um, I also want to preface by saying I'm not a pastor or an MDiv or really don't have any formal preaching experience. So this um, is more gonna be some musings and reflections on this passage that I've chosen. Um, I do, however, uh, a little bit about me, I do work in the public policy and government affairs sort of sphere. Um, I work for a, I work remotely for an organization in New York City, which is called Vibrant Emotional Health. It is the um, national administrator of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, some of you might know what that is, uh, but it's it's the national suicide hotline. Um, and I, I I'm going to be talking a little bit in this about um, mental health and suicide and. Um, those things, so I'm just giving you a, a, a trigger warning on that, um, if that's a, a sensitivity. Um, well, as we step into the scripture this morning, um, in John chapter 4, I'd like to just take a moment to pause, take a deep breath, um, and ask God to be with us, um, that we might hear something either new or something something on our heart today. Reading from John chapter 4. I believe this is verse 3. I deleted all the verse numbers, so I'm not exactly sure. For sure. But, so Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he passed through Samaria. He came into Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was still there, and Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. Um, and it says that it was, it was noon, so it was about the middle of the day. A woman, a, a Samaritan woman, came to draw water from the well. Um, Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? Um, for his disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. And the Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink. Um, Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. And I'm going to pause right there and talk about that for just a, a little bit, because there are a few things there that I think stand out. Um, and when I started thinking about this, I wanted to go back and sort of see, because it, it I want to see where Judea was and where Galilee was, because it says that he's been traveling a long ways. Um, and so Judea is sort of west of the Dead Sea, sort of near Jerusalem, sort of central, modern-day Israel. Um, and Galilee is sort of in northern Israel, sort of by Lebanon. Um, and in order to get from Judea to Galilee, uh, Jesus had to walk through Samaria, um, which is sort of the modern-day um, Palestinian West Bank. Um, which has been in the news recently. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about that modern conflict, only to say that the Jewish people and the Samaritans did not get along very well. Um, we're told this in scripture right here when Jesus is uh, 
asking this woman for a drink, and, um, well, Jews would not be ta- caught dead talking to Samaritans, the scripture tells us. Um, I also could not help but see um, sort of a comparison between um, the dynamic of the Jews and the Samaritans to the modern day Christian church and the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Um, For centuries, if not millennia, um, the Christian church, um, and especially the American Christian church, has been no friend of the LGBTQ community. Um, And I I would even go so far as to say the Presbyterian Church, USA, has been no friend of the LGBT community. Um, And I I was thinking about writing this, and I was struggling because I I sort of put militant language in here because it feels to me like the American church has been at war with the queer community for some time. I think it's a a war of exclusion, a war of intolerance, of self-righteousness, of fear, of fear of change, of hatred, um, very one-sided, and and it's a war that's still going on today um, in our nation, in the church universal, um, even in some Presbyterian churches. and in fact, uh, in 2023 so far, according to the, um, I believe it was the Human Rights Watch, but not entirely, I have to check my source on that, but there have been more than 500 bills that have been introduced across this country, 500 bills and legislation that have been targeting the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, most of them introduced by people professing Christian faith. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an, an ongoing thing in the church. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But I think that we are, uh, um, well, I want to acknowledge, and I'm not trying to be depressing here, but <laughs> I know, I, and there's joy at the end, I promise. I will bring joy. <laughs> but this, this war that I'm talking about has casualties. It's a real a real thing. It's, I said it's one-sided, but the casualties are not only the queer community's perception of the church and of Christians and of Christianity. It's not only the perception of, oh, Christians believe that I'm going to hell because I'm whatever I identify as, because of what I am. It's not only that, but there are literal lives lost. Um, I, I, uh, Brooke shared some of these statistics yesterday at the Covenant Conversation, and I'd, I'd like to share them again. Um, and these are slightly different, but according to the Trevor Project, um, 45% of LGBTQ youth have seriously considered attempting suicide in the last year. More than half of transgender and non- non-binary youth have also done that. LGBTQ plus young people are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. And right here in Delaware, and actually, since I work for the Lifeline, I pulled Delaware's numbers. um, And I apologize, they're from July, because I don't have my work computer on this trip. (laughs) But in July, when the, the network launched the LGBTQ plus dedicated youth subnetwork because we launched it because there's such a need. Um, in July, there were 64 calls received in the first month. And those are 64 young people under the age of 24 from this state, from this region that are calling. And yet, in the midst of all of this pain and suffering of people that historically have been told, you know, you're not welcome here. In the midst of all of that, it it feels sometimes like as people that want to reject that and don't want anything to do with that and want to be accepting and affirming, 
sometimes it feels like the problem is bigger than us. Like, it's just too much to grasp. Like, our, our little congregation or our little side of our denomination or cannot undo all of the, the wider church's impact. Well, what can we do? I, I'd like to turn back to the text now. Back to, back to the scripture. Um, we find ourselves in Sychar, in the land of Jacob and Joseph. Um, actually, we, it's very specific. It says it's at Joseph's well. Um, and there's a tangent, but I couldn't help but remember that Joseph was the one with the rainbow coat of many colors. So that was pretty, <laughs> pretty fun <laughs> to read. Um, but then we find this, this Samaritan woman. Um, and this woman, like many women in the scriptures, goes unnamed. We never you know, figure out who she is. Um, but she has this conversation with Jesus that we're about to hear. Um, and I, I'd just like you to listen in. Okay, I'm going to repeat a couple things so we can get back into the context. A woman, a Samaritan woman, came to draw water from the well. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you wouldn't be asking, you would be asking me for a drink and I would give you fresh, living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. How are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it, and his sons and his livestock, and he, he passed it down to us to drink as well? Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. And whoever drinks the water I will give will never thirst, not ever. I will give you, or the water I give will be an artesian spring with gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again and again. And I want you to listen into this, this, this next couple questions. He said, go, call your husband and come back. And then she said, she replies, sir, I don't have a husband. And, and Jesus has this sort of quip that says, that's nicely put. I have no husband. You're, you're right. <laughs> You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. You spoke truth there, sure enough. And I want to pause there again, um, because I, I really, when I first was thinking about this passage, I just remember the woman at the well, and there's this sort of testy exchange. Um, but it just reminded me so much of being a queer person in Christian spaces when you're not sure if they are affirming or not or even if they say they're affor affirming, but you, you're visiting and you just, you don't know if you can be yourself or not. Um, I think that there's something that called, well, I don't know if it's actually called this, I just called this and I like it. So, <laughs> queer fear that exists in Christian spaces. Um, did you hear when Jesus said, go call your husband and come back? And she said, I have no husband. That sort of little half-truth that um, the Samaritan woman gave, it, it reminded me a lot of, like, if you go to a church and, um, I don't know, I, I've not had this experience myself, but I've heard others talk about it. Um, when you go with a, your partner, if, if I had a boyfriend and I brought them, and they, and I was asked, oh, is that your best friend? And, or, or you're asked what the relationship is there, and um, you, you give a truthful answer, but
But it's not fully true because you don't know how people will respond. There's some fear there that I think that a lot of um, queer people bring into spaces that, you know, historically have not been welcoming and fully affirming. I think that this conversation, this little back and forth, is also really interesting because, um, because of the way that Jesus sees right through that, that Jesus um, says, you're right, that's nicely put, you've got no husband, you have had five. I think that God knows each one of us in our deepest, most secretive, most innate selves. He knows that the things, what those things are deep down in our hearts, and yet he still chooses us. Jesus still chose to have this conversation and even ask this Samaritan woman for water. Um, I think that each one of us carries shame that we each carry, well, queer or not, we are each beloved children of God. Um, and I think there's something about that intimate way that Jesus approaches this conversation with this Samaritan woman. Um, there's something intimate about hearing this deep down secret that this woman obviously did not want to talk about. I mean, she said, I have no husband. She wasn't like, Oh, I'm, I have a, you know, someone. I guess it was a different culture there. I, I admit that. It was, it was different. I mean, it was a purity and shame culture, and they didn't talk about that as much. But I, I, I think that, you know, there is this embrace of, you know, come as you are um, and really authentically and intentionally um, there's room for, room for all people, and I think that's important. Um, and I think this is one place where, as a congregation that wants to live into this sort of commitment to welcome and to affirmation and into inclusion, um, this is one of the places where there's really room for us to do that. Um, and, and I don't think, well, I think that yesterday at the Covenant conversation, it was really great to hear from um, the speakers and to hear from Brooke. I think Brooke offered some great ideas in her slides, and you guys are in, in great hands <laughs> to do some of that and to take steps, and I already hear you talking about some of the steps you can take. Um, but it's, I think it's more than just putting up a, a, a flag on a door or on your website. Um, it has to really become the ethos of the congregation. Um, and I, I think for you guys, from what I've seen so far, I, I believe that it is. Um, and it takes intentionality, and it takes um, really rethinking some of the things that have just sort of become, this is what we do. Um, and I, I, I said, I told Brooke that I would talk about the Covenant Network, and I feel like I should as I am representing them. Um, but I, I want to share, first of all, gratitude that you guys have decided to join the Covenant Network. Um, I think that being a part of this network of now 400 or so churches across the United States that have said we are really committed to welcome of all people is important and that, um, you know, I think there are areas of, you know, being a, being a member of the Covenant Network is only one step. There's so much work to do internally and to do in the city or in this town. Um, but being a part of the Covenant Network allows you to see sort of Beyond the local impact, it allows you to see as a denomination and as a, uh, as a presbytery, um, it allows you to join efforts um, more broadly. And then one, one example that I will give, um, we, so in Washington State and the Olympia Presbytery that I'm a part of, um, we had a covenant conversation uh, last, uh, when was this? like last October, November, it's been a year. Um, and we, we had this conversation because there was concern about how inclusive and affirming our presbytery was. Um, 
And through the Covenant Network's support and pulling together um, resources and having this conversation, um, we have now sort of, I don't want to say be we've become an advocacy or advocate presbytery, but I think that we have um, felt emboldened by the, by the covenant conversation, but also by the, um, just the, the seeing that other congregations around us support this, and it's no longer, oh, we're the only ones, or no, we're not only just, um, th like there is, I think there's power in numbers, and I think that's something that comes from being a part of a network like this. Um, and I will just say, this on my little soapbox for a second, that um, the Olympia Presbytery put forward an overture to the General Assembly, um, and this is our first time doing it apparently since the, like the 1970s or 80s, so it's been a while, um, but that would remove language, um, or, or no, it would not remove, it would add language that makes it so that uh, churches cannot discriminate based on gender identity and sexuality. And I, the Covenant Network has been very influential in helping us get that passed, and now um, we're just talking about this in our board meeting, um, working to um, build movement for it across the denomination. So I'm, I'm glad you guys are part of the Covenant Network. I can talk about it more later, but I would like to jump again into scripture. Um, and as we finish this up here, I believe when I was preparing for this, and I'll tell you, I, I was asked to preach on Monday or Tuesday of last week, so I've, <laughs> I've not had a whole lot of time. And when I, was, when I heard that um, you guys are doing a series on heroic women, and I thought, as a white, bi, cisgendered man, <laughs> I, can, I can do that, I think. <laughs> um, and, and I was trying to think of the women in the Bible, and there are many, many. Um, and Brooke sent me a list of all the ones you'd already done, so I was like, oh, I can't do those ones. <laughs> um, but something about this woman at the well just kept jumping out at me, and just, so I read it, and I sort of started, started forming ideas and starting to write some things out, um, and I didn't really know what to do at the end, because I hadn't read it. I was reading it in the NRSV, and then I took it, and I, I looked at Eugene Peterson's The Message, while I was on the plane over here, and I think that this might be one of the most affirming texts that I've ever read in the Bible. Um, and I, 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 as I close here, I just, I'm going to read this, and I think that um, someone at, at our board meeting on Friday said, you know, the Covenant Network does not want really what we're asking for at, at a denominational level, at a congregational level, and as, as Christians that want to be a place of welcome and affirmation and inclusion, we're not looking for too much. We just want a place where people can come and be. Just be. So I'm going to read again from the scripture to close us out. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this, the Samaritan woman says. Our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain. But you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father, neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark, we worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews, but the time is coming. The time has come, in fact. When, you will, when what you're called will not matter where you go to worship, it won't matter what you're called to do. I, I butchered that really bad. Let me, but the time is coming. It has, in fact, come. When what you're called will not matter. And where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way that you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit 
in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is sheer being itself, spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. The woman said, I don't know about that. I, I do know that the Messiah is coming, and when he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, Jesus said. You don't have to wait any longer. I want to leave it there, but I also just want to say I think that I, I think that there is much work to do, but truly all of that work is pointing and working to be a church and a congregation, a denomination, where people can just be, be and be, they don't have to give half-truths about who they are or what relationships they're in. They can just be. So. Oh, and you guys have a conversation afterwards, I've heard. <laughs> so <laughs> I wonder if we can just take a deep breath, and then I'm curious to know if what you're thinking and if you have questions or whatnot, leave it open to you guys. I don't know if I'm supposed to sit down or what. I can stay up here. Sure. Uh, thank you. This is one of my always been one of my favorite stories is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, but I had not thought about the parallel. Thought about the parallel between the Samaritan and the Jews historic conflict, um, but connecting that to other marginalized um, communities. Um, and, I, and I appreciate you sharing the, the concept of queer fear because it's not something that comes to mind, you know. Um, I immediately think, how many times have I asked a question that may have prompted a uh, that kind of response, not intentionally. Um, but the the bottom line about Jesus, Jesus' response, and I'm glad you read the message because it, it I've read that many that passage many times, but I haven't thought about it in this context. So it was really um, illuminating. Um, and it's gonna I'm gonna ponder more. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your your words today, and and you said you weren't a minister or you weren't trained, but your message was loud and clear, and you should be a minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about the the amount of time that's passed that we've been fighting this war, <laughs> and I was thinking about um, my daughter was married 28 years ago in a Methodist church. And 40 years ago, I served on a conference, in, a, in the Methodist Conference. And when you use the word queer fear, that term today, that was so apparent to me 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I think about all the time that has passed and how sometimes things seem to be getting worse rather than better, um, it's just... Um, it's just sad to me. It's just sad. Yesterday at the conference, there was a, um, one of the panelists that spoke that talked about how, as a minister, he, during his journey, he had to um, stay in the closet, say. Mm -hmm. uh, part, of his, part of his time, part of his time, he was open. And I, and I, I almost cried when I, when I was listening to him because I thought, how does he preach the gospel and then leave, get in his car, and drive away and feel so 
dishonest about who he was. It's awful that we have managed to put people in this position in so many ways. And when you talked about the, the suicide rate of young people today, that was the one thing that really touched me yesterday when Brooke said that about sometimes these kids are less than 15 years old. And I kept thinking to myself, they don't even know what they're doing at 15. They haven't even grown or matured enough to know what, what life is all about. And we're killing them. It's our responsibility because they don't know. They really don't at that age. They really don't, can't understand or fathom what, what, is, what they're giving up. So um, I'm just thankful for young people like you who are willing to step out and be um, outspoken about who they are. And I just want to thank you for doing that today and bring, bringing here today. And, and we, hope that, we hope that our church is a place where people can come and just be. Hi, I actually wanted to speak for a minute about um, how impactful it can be for someone to have a place to just be. Um, hi, local trans man here. Um, not that surprising, not news. Um, but in like 2021, I had an incident where I got a really bad concussion and the doctor refused me medical treatment because I was trans. Um, and I went back in the, like, back in the closet, not in my personal life, like all my friends knew, but I stopped my transition anywhere where doctors or the government could see it for a hot minute because that was scary. I was out of state and I didn't have someone who could stand up for me other than myself. And I was concussed, so I was not in a great place to stand up for myself. Uh, and it scared me. Um, and then I came back here to my home state and I started working here and Brooke was nothing but lovely to me and all of y'all were nothing but lovely to me. And I went back to the theater across the street and came out to them because they knew me before I came out and just having those two supportive places. Um, I eventually got to the point where in July, I. <laughs> it was, oh gosh. <laughs> so, yeah. You just want to go up here? Okay, we're good again, and this way I can pass around to y'all. Um, but um, it, after spending like a year surrounded by the places I have been, um, in July I went back on testosterone again, and now I'm in the process of saving up for my legal name change, and it just, it makes a difference. And something that is very heartbreaking for me is that I'm 22, I'm pretty young, <laughs> and yet I am the safe adult for multiple queer people and especially trans people I've met who are younger than me. Friends, younger siblings who I met when they were like 15, 16 and I was in college and I shouldn't be the safe adult. I'm 22. I have no idea what I'm doing. And <laughs> like, I, I only just got my safe adults. Like I, um, and so like being able to just be an open place 
is so important and I think it's just important for whether you're an ally or a member of the queer community to just be someone people can feel safe around. Um, I don't know. <laughs> sharing, being vulnerable. Um, thank you very much for the way in which you um, explained uh, the scripture and connected it with your own particular experiences, work, and so forth. Um, very effectively done, and you are a good speaker. <laughs> And uh, whatever you do later in life, I'm sure that speaking will be a part of it. Public speaking will be a part of it in whatever format that takes. I, I simply wanted to say whenever I hear the story of the woman at the well, I remember vividly a long time ago someone pointing something out to me about that particular story, saying that when the woman said, I have no husband, and Jesus responded and said, no, but you've had uh, five husbands. That, that was not a criticism that Jesus was making, because in those days, a woman could not have had five husbands. Uh, rather, uh, five men have taken advantage of her. And Jesus was laying his hand on where she was hurting. <laughs> And that affirmed her in very important ways so she could go on with the conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's something that I always want to point out <laughs> yeah. uh, for future reference and so forth, that uh, Jesus was, and often when people say that, when uh, they hear it, they, they stick her even, because they think that Jesus is, is attacking her yeah. morally. And Jesus was not doing that, but simply saying, I know where you are hurting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is affirming to her. And so, anyway, yes. thank you thank very you. much for all that you said today. I think this was part of the reading in the church service yesterday, but to kind of summarize a lot of this. And when we, we have so many times where we look at social justice and um, the, f the bottom line is fear. Mm -hmm. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Yes, thank you for, um, it's very memorable for what you spoke about today, and it hits home with me because my granddaughter, who is now 12, but when she was about 10, she was thinking she may be gay. And um, my son was trying to deal with it, and he said, okay, we'll, we'll work on this, we'll you know, do what we have to do if that's what you truly fear, feel like you want to, to be. Um, and now she's in middle, in middle school in seventh grade, and she says, no, I don't think that's me. I think, I think I'm going to be a woman. Um, well, she just had a birthday, and we've talked many times, but I gave her a sign that said, just put this in your room, and it says, just be you. And she looked at me like, what does that mean? I said, whatever your life is going to be, and you may change your mind again, but be who you are. Don't have that fear in you that you're changing your mind because of fear. Just be you and talk to me anytime. Just remember that you're a beautiful person, you are who you are, and be you. So thank you for that message. It really touched home. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. I was really uh, focused on the half-truths. Half and I'm going to relay a conversation I had on Friday when I thought I was coming here. And I have a question. Brooke, 
was Hanover originally West Hanover? Is that the same church? Okay. Well, maybe you can tell me if this is the same one or not. But I had said to some friends, thinking that I was going to go to the event yesterday, what I was going to, and a friend who had gone to, maybe it was West something else, but it was a church in Wilmington that apparently, whether the structure is there, the, the congregation has moved on. And she said, that's what ended our church. And I said, oh, what happened? And she said they had become an affirming church and they hired um, a pastor who was out and they liked him and they hired him. And what she described as what happened, I was going to myself, this, this has happened in so many other churches when it hasn't been gays and I don't think it's been that result. But it turned out that the pastor had a partner that he, mm -hmm. that he did not um, tell them about. So they felt that that was a bad thing. And the partner either was also ordained or preached a lot and he would have him come in and preach. Now, as my friend told it, the church felt, again, you didn't tell us about this. We didn't ask, you know, for a, a duo. And, you know, she didn't really give me the details of everything that happened, but sh the way in her mind um, it caused the church to dissolve. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really sad, but then I also thought, you know, there's been lots of times in churches when pastors have come and with their wives, and it has ended up being a situation where they both preach, and most of the time when I hear about it, it's like, oh, great, we got two for one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and yet, because of this situation, they looked at it as um, dishonesty. And, you know, it just, I thought, really fed into what you were talking about with the half, half truce. So I ask you the question because I was curious if there's mm -hmm. some perspective about what might have really, and I'm not saying that wasn't what happened, but I'm sure there was a lot to it. There was some church in Wilmington, yeah. 